Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Zen Master Genpo Mursal, also known as Genpo Roshi. And I, I thought I might just uh, start by reading a few quotes uh, from well-known people about um, Genpo's work that are on the home page of his website, and uh, then we'll let him speak for himself. Uh, here we go. So Ken Wilber says, and probably most of you listening to this know who Ken Wilber is, let me state this as strongly as I can. The Big Mind process, founded by Zen master Genpo Mersel, is arguably the most important and original discovery in the last two centuries of Buddhism. It is an astonishing, original, profound, and effective path for waking up or seeing one's true nature. Uh, here's one by Zen master Bernie Glassman. By integrating Western psychological insights with Eastern transcendent practice, Big Mind, Big Heart helps bring light to all our voices, those of depression, anger, and confusion, as well as those of unity and transcendence. The consciousness that emerges is integrated, free, and world-embracing. And one final quote from Jack Canfield, author of the Chicken Soup series. Um, I want to really encourage you to get involved in the work of Zen Master Genpo Mertzel. Every time I've worked with him, I've had major breakthroughs and major insights. His big mind process is tremendously valuable because it's so universal. It works whether someone has been working for 40 years or they're just starting out. So, um, I've listened to you do your big mind thing, and, and we'll be talking about that during this interview. Um, I've also listened to four or five hours of audio of you over the last week. I, I, I do that before I interview each guest. I listen to a lot of stuff. Uh, on my iPod, usually while I'm brushing my teeth or washing the dishes. <laughs> you How's <know>. your head? <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's fine. And and I must say that I've really enjoyed um, your sense of humor, uh, your unpretentiousness, um, your kind of down-to-earth approach and, and, and way of dealing with people. Um, it's very refreshing and, uh, you know, very what you see is what you get, you know, no, not, not any sort of putting on airs kind of thing. And uh, so I've, I feel like I've kind of gotten to know you, and it's been very enjoyable. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, it took uh, a few years to climb the mountain. It's taken almost 40 years to descend it. Ha, ha. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, to be just ordinary and normal. Interesting point, yeah. Um, interestingly, I've never practiced Zen, but uh, Zen actually had a, or Buddhism and Zen had sort of a, important role to play in a couple of critical junctures in my life. When I was 17, I was driving down the road through Westport, Connecticut with three friends in the car, and uh, one of them in the back seat was reading from Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert's uh, version of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and it suddenly dawned on me that there was such a thing as enlightenment, and that's what it was all about, you know. So that was one thing. And then a year later, after I'd been taking drugs for a year, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was sitting there one night reading Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, uh, that little book, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, wow, these guys are serious, and I'm just screwing around. And if I continue on like this, I'm going to be miserable all my life. So that's it. I'm going to stop taking drugs, learn to meditate, and see where it takes me. And that's what I did. What year was that? That I'm was curious. 1968. Okay, because I thought it was probably around the same time yeah. uh, as me. My first uh, awakening experience was actually in February of 1971. Mm -hmm. So in a month, uh, it'll actually be 40 years uh, like yourself, uh, which uh -huh. is like 43 years, yeah. Uh, also had done some drugs at that time, uh, mm -hmm. but was actually sitting on a mountaintop mm -hmm. uh, alone, and my friends had gone off hiking, and I was sitting there contem contemplating my life mm -hmm. when I had this opening experience where I dropped the self, or the self was dropped, and uh, body-mind was dropped off, and I was one with the entire cosmos, the entire universe, and it uh, changed my life forever. Mm. Uh, I've never been quite the same. My mother said, you went insane. I <laughs> argued, I argued, no, I, I think I've gone sane, yeah. but that was probably debatable, and at this point, I, I think she was right. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's funny. I was thinking about that today, and I was thinking, you know, uh, over the course of my whole spiritual career, there. If I look back on it, there are many times where I was out of my blooming mind. You know, I mean, just because you go through so much inner transformation, you know, and it and you sort of tend to disassociate from the so-called real world and, and get caught up in your own subjective world. And 
and sometimes you can really get quite uh, eccentric, you know. And, and as you said earlier, you know, it took 40 years to come down the mountain. I mean, it takes a while to integrate all this. It, it certainly does, and uh, you know, uh, I think it's an amazing journey that we've had, and I think we're all very lucky to live in the age that we do. Mm. I think it's an uh, it's an amazing period of time right now where so much is accessible, uh, and I really believe that uh, the whole evolution of consciousness, that we're becoming more and more conscious as human beings, and tapping into that, whatever we want to call, we call it one mind, or cosmic consciousness, or universal consciousness, and uh, there's just so many people around the globe doing that, and I think if we can reach a critical mass uh, of those of us who do want to help others awaken and others do awaken, we can actually reach the next level of consciousness, in, maybe in our lifetime even. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, and you know, when you heat up water, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and nothing seems to be happening. But as soon as it reaches 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it starts to boil. And so we don't know what temperature we're at. You know, we might be at 200 right now, for, for all we know, you know. Or, or 211. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So let's just keep heating the water. That's right. I kind of liken it to uh, when there's a truck that uh, the battery won't start. It's a big, heavy truck. Mm -hmm. And you've got a slight decline, but not much. And you get a bunch of people behind it, and you just push it. If you get enough backs into it, you can get that truck going. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that it's going to happen. I'm almost 100% positive that it will happen. But if we all, but we're going to all have to throw our backs into it and do our, our share, you know, whatever yeah. our share is to help awaken the planet. Yeah, well, you've certainly been doing yours. Um, after you had that experience 40 years ago, um, I mean, how long did it last? And, and what, did you do, <laughs> what did you do right after that? Well, for one thing, it's, I'm not down yet. <laughs> <laughs> Good, so it's still going on. <laughs> it's still going on, but... Uh, I would say that I was high for a good year. Uh -huh. I don't think my touched the ground uh, until I got to the Zen Center in Los Angeles, which was a year and a month later. Mm -hmm. uh, I got there in March of 1972, and that kind of brought me back to earth, uh -huh. going to the Zen Center and, and really studying with uh, you know a traditional Zen master. In fact, his teacher was my first teacher that I did retreats with. So my Zimiroshi's teacher, whose name was Koryu Roshi. Mm -hmm. I did my retreats in March of 72, and then again in September, I think August and September of, of 72. And uh, then at that point, Roshi uh, became my teacher, Mizumi Roshi. And I studied with him until his death, which was 1995, mm -hmm. um, which was a long time yeah. uh, to be with a teacher. And to go very deep, and we went through all the Kohan studies by 1979, and he made me a, a Zen sensei in 1980. That means and a teacher? Class, yeah, that means a teacher, exactly. Okay. And then a Zen master in 1996, uh, mm -hmm. September of 96, uh, I became a Zen master where Lee Glassman Roshi, uh, mm -hmm. who was my older Dharma brother and also a teacher and mentor of mine, about five, six years older than me, mm -hmm. and also my best friend, uh, made me a Zen master in 1996. So it sounds like there's an official kind of system or hierarchy or something, and you get appro approved to take on certain titles um, by senior or more advanced uh, people. Is that the way that's, it works? That, that's exactly right. That's correct. Uh -huh. However, it doesn't stop people from taking on titles. Uh, <laughs> right. Like that anyways, but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, there is a, a kind of standard way or more traditional way, and it's called, for particularly for, uh, well, for both, for the final... It's called the final seal of approval. That's called Inca, and that's as a Zen master. And then there's Shiho. That's the Dharma of transmission, uh -huh. translate as Dharma transmission. That's what I had in 1980, and that's what makes you a Zen teacher, a sensei. How do they determine uh, whether you're qualified? Is there some sort of test, or is there some sort of psychic cognition of what state you've attained, or how does it work exactly? Well, it's more of a psychic cognition. It's it's a realization that you're there. I mean, I've made. Uh, eight uh, Zen masters and 15 senses. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's really subjective, mm -hmm. but there is a, a level where you just know that the person 
is a master now. Although, when you first become a master, like for me it was, what, 16 years ago, almost 17. Uh, is that right? 96 to 2001. Yeah, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, i got to say that for probably 12 of those years, or 10 of those years at least, uh, I was a very immature Zen master in that I still had to write them. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm all that ripe now, uh, <laughs> except in some other ways. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you have to grow into it also. Yeah. Like, um, uh, in the people I've made, uh, Zen masters or Roshis, mm -hmm. uh, the earliest one is now probably eight years. Mm. And she's starting to really ripen, and I can see it, and becoming a, a true master. So it doesn't mean just because you're anointed with the title of Zen master that you're really a mature one in the beginning. I think that goes for everything. Yeah. When you first become a sensei, too, uh, you're going to be an immature one for quite some time. I mean, for me, it was 1980, and I don't feel I matured as a sensei until about 1995, 96. Hmm. Huh. What, uh, this is uh, so it's a little picayune, but what is the difference? Uh, a sensei is a teacher, a master is a master. Uh, it's sort of like sounds like kind of like first class and Eagle Scout and Boy Scouts or something. I mean, is there? Uh, what is it? What distinguishes the two? Yeah, I, I can try to explain that. And it's not general. It's not always true. It's a kind of generalization, I can say. Mm -hmm. uh, but a teacher teaches, and a master empowers. Uh -huh. A master, and if I use a, a little analogy, when you climb to the top of the mountain, we call that the absolute or the transcendent. Mm -hmm. And really, to be a teacher, you should have at least done that much. Right. You know, reach that absolute state of I am Buddha, uh, mm -hmm. I am awake, I am the awakened one. Mm -hmm. Where you can actually really say that with some, you know, confidence. sincerity. Right. Yeah, confidence. Um, and at that point, uh, at the top of the mountain, you can encourage people to climb up. Mm -hmm. You can uh, coach them. Uh, you can uh, inspire them. Mm -hmm. uh, you can yell down at them and say, you know, it's really great, this enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, it's complete liberation. It's total freedom. You're free of fear. You're free of suffering. You know, work hard, practice hard, sit a lot, uh, and you too can reach this state. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about what you can do as a teacher. Mm -hmm. As a master, you've fallen off the mountain, or you've come down off the mountain. It's usually more of a fall than a conscious choice to come down. Mm -hmm. You come down off the mountain, and you're back in what we call the muddy water, or back in the grime, or back in the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the manure. And from that place, you can actually lift somebody up. You can actually get under them. Mm. You know, under their backside, let's say, <laughs> and just elevate them up. You can push them up. That's empowering a person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as a teacher, you're teaching, and in the way, and it's sad, sad to say, you're kind of teaching down to, uh -huh. and there's that element. And when, when you look back as a master, you think, oh, my God, that was horrible. You know, I'm teaching down to, uh -huh. you know, trying to inspire people to come up to. Whereas a master, you're just in the same grind, the same grit, you know, the same stuff as everybody else, and uh, you don't feel superior. You feel like one with, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm just an ordinary being, an ordinary sentient being, just like everybody else, and yet I've been through this climbing the mountain and then descending the mountain, mm -hmm. so I kind of know the territory so I can guide, but I can also and still inspire and still encourage. But there's more of an ability to actually empower. Mm -hmm. And you don't mean to imply that this coming down from the mountain uh, involves a loss of, of the awakened state or the Buddha nature. I mean, somehow it, it sounds to me more like an integration. Well, it feels a lot, lot like loss. Really? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> That's why very few people actually do it. Because it really feels like you're giving something up. You know, mm -hmm. uh, like my first enlightenment, as I mentioned, was 1971. Right. And then I had many, many, many experiences from 71 until now. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 86, I had the what was at that point the most profound enlightenment we call Daikensho or Great Enlightenment. That was in March of 1986. 
uh, where at that point there was just no more fear, no more suffering. Uh, so many of the human elements are just gone, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's complete liberation, it's nirvana, it's, it's complete freedom. Yeah. Uh, to come down off the mountain really means to once again feel the suffering of all sentient beings, mm -hmm. to feel the fear and the anxiety of suffering sentient beings, to feel like everybody else, to have all the emotions everybody else has, mm -hmm. uh, to get angry, to, to uh, get enraged maybe, to get frightened, mm -hmm. uh, to be once again a mortal, not a Buddha, you know, a sentient being. We call it, in the vernacular, it's called a Bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. The Buddha is the one who ascends the mountain, and the Bodhisattva gives up the enlightenment in order to liberate all sentient beings. That's what a Bodhisattva is, like Kanzion or Onyin or Avakiteshvara, they're really all the same, just different uh, national, just different languages and nationalities to refer to the same being that is here to really liberate all beings. But if you're up there on top of the mountain, you can't do much. There's no power to empower, we mm -hmm. say. You have to actually come down off the mountain. So you are giving up enlightenment in a way. You're giving up the kudos of enlightenment. I call it falling from grace. You're giving up that state of grace that maybe you were in for all those years. For me, it was from 71 until 94. Mm -hmm. I was in that state. Of course, it was more profound by 86. Right. It was deeper. But from 71 to 94, it was like, you know, you're just kind of uh, beyond. Uh, the suffering that we all encounter. And that's what inspires you to go on and go deeper and to help others because you find that freedom and liberation and peace. But eventually, and it's a hard one for people to, as I said, to voluntarily do, is to come back down off a mountain to descend it and be an ordinary sense of being. And then for me, from 94 until 99, which was again almost exactly five years, um, I had, I still resisted being back in the mud, you know, uh, I resisted being back in the samsaric world. And I was in some ways trying to recapture or reclimb the mountain, you know, get back up. And at that point, the mountain is just made of sheer ice. <laughs> and you, can't, you can't get a foothold in it. No yeah. way. You know, before it was like, oh, this nice path, you know, that you're climbing and it's a little difficult, a little rugged, you know, uh, maybe a little rocky, but it wasn't sheer ice. After you fall down, you look back and you go, oh my God, that's just sheer ice. And uh, there's no way up that mountain again. Then what you have to do is consciously make a choice, consciously, I call it consciously choose, to be a human being mm -hmm. with all the pain and suffering that we as human beings feel. And with that, um, yeah, comes a humanness. Uh, instead of being like above everybody or better than everybody or greater than or, you know, you know what kind of Buddha I'm talking about. <laughs> you Buddha, you know, you're actually uh, really just a human being, an ordinary person. We say like a lotus in muddy water. Mm. There's an old Stephen Wright joke where he says he broke up with his girlfriend because he wasn't really into meditation and she really wasn't into being alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and it sounds to me like what you're saying. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're saying, okay, you were a sensei and now you're a master. Uh, it sounds to me like you've come full circle in a way, like the 10th ox herding picture, and that, you know, you have brought something back from the mountain. It's not like you're back to where you were before you started climbing it. You've brought something back. And, and the mountain phase, it sounds to me, if, I, if I'm interpreting this correctly, was one in which there was a... Uh, a lot of dispassion, aloofness, de detachment, you know, right. e de equanimity, perhaps the disinterestedness, and so on. And uh, you know, now you're kind of back into the nitty gritty of being a human being, as you say. And uh, you know, it's personally, I don't think I don't. I'm, I may be wrong. I don't see it so much as a fall or a descent, as as more of an integration uh, or a a kind of a maturation of of this, you know, it's a it's a it's a state of progress. It's not a it's not a um, a loss. Would you would you agree? 
I would. Uh, <laughs> I have a few things to say. Uh -huh. um, in the tradition, we call that stage, which I call fall from grace, advanced achievement. So it is an advancement. Yeah. But it feels. Feels like, right. It does. It feels yeah. like a fall. Yeah. I mean, you, you fall off the mountain. You don't mm -hmm. just climb down. Nobody does that. You know? right. Okay, I'm, I've enjoyed this great view from the top of the mountain now for umpteen years, and now I'm just going to start to walk back down the mountain. No way. You, you actually fall and, uh, or, or descend quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you talked about the 10th Oxford picture, which is exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, and nine of the pictures, of course, uh, are before the 10th. Right. And so the 10th is returning to the marketplace. That's the real fall. Everything else, all those nine picks before the 10th, are all forms of emptying yourself out, becoming more selfless, mm -hmm. you know, discipline, uh, taming the ox, and, and so forth, you know, going deeper and deeper and deeper into enlightenment. And the tenth is you're back in the marketplace with gift bestowing hands carrying a, a jug of wine in one hand and a pack of goodies, a bag of goodies in the other. But you're just an ordinary guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. In, in the marketplace world. And, yeah. and for me, that means you brought back all your shadows. Hmm. In other words, when we become spiritual, what we seem to do is we disown everything that we consider not very spiritual. Right. You know, I'm sure you've been through that. Oh, yeah. And so you, you, dis, you disown, in a way, you, you, you push away greed, you push away being um, self-centered, ego-centered, selfish, unloving, uncaring, angry, and all those become shadows. I might and then, interject and say that it's not that you actually divest yourself of those things. You may still be very much, you know, d indulging that's in them. That's what but, I was getting at. Yeah, but you push away your sort of acknowledgement of them, you know? Exactly. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. That's what I meant. You, you disown them. Right. They become shadows, and you don't really divest yourself of them. Uh, you're not really free of them. It's just you only can't see them. You're the yeah, other, other people may see them all too well, but but you're kind of uh, on your little mountain. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and other people do see them. They see you're just as competitive. You know, I was a highly competitive athlete, you know, oh. uh, in uh, water polo and swimming in, in my day. As competitive as you get, you know. I mean, we went undefeated uh, in a college. We were a two-year college, you know, junior college. We beat all the four-year schools that year. We beat all the two-year schools. We beat everybody. But we just wouldn't lose because we we're highly competitive athletes, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's ever been done before or since in, in water polo, you know, in 1963. Um, and uh, when I became spiritual in 71, I just, oh, no, I'm not competitive anymore, you know. And so, but if you ask anybody that trained with me in the 70s and 80s, they'll say, Gimple? <laughs> Not competitive. <laughs> Most competitive guy I've ever met. But I, I can sit here on my mat longer than any of you guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I can do longer retreats than anybody. You know, we we were called the Olympians of Zen right. in the uh, late '80s and early '90s. We did three month sessions. Nobody's done that since the 1200s or uh -huh. 1300s. You know, uh -huh. three months of session. People do three months on go, but that's about half the amount of sitting as a session. Uh -huh. and a session. Mm -hmm. You know, you sit 10, 12 hours a day, you're there uh, for 90 days. You know, we took the 30th and the 60th day, we took a little break to do our laundry and wash our robes. <laughs> yeah. You know, so very competitive, but just didn't see it. So back to the what you were saying, uh, the, the shadows then uh, keep us from really, really integrating, as you were saying, integrating the aspects that we disown. So a lot of my work now is all about helping, uh, and myself too, uh, reintegrate the parts of myself that I left behind and others, so assumingly, you know, left behind or, or thought, thought I left behind, and then integrate it. So for me, returning to the marketplace is really dealing with the shadows around the marketplace, being competitive, being prostituting ourselves, selling ourselves, you know, um, taking taking responsibility for being 
greedy or being ambitious or being any of these things, but owning them. So they're no longer at work in an insidious way or in a covert way under undermining us, that we can really come from what I call the apex of the triangle. So we have the spiritual on the right-hand side, the transcendent, and we have, let's say, the conventional or marketplace mind on the left side of the triangle, and we're really coming from the apex where we've integrated both the marketplace mind and the awakened mind or the spiritual mind uh, to a point where I don't even consider myself spiritual anymore. I wouldn't use that label, just ordinary. But you said something else I wanted to come back to, and you were talking about the circle and, and going full circle. That's why we don't complete the circle in Zen. You'll notice that in Zen, that circle is never completed. It's mm. always got that little bit of Like space. on your shirt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot it's there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that... That circle is that it's never complete. Mm -hmm. And when we return, we return, and yet we're not really back to the same place we were. It's an advancement. It's like a, a spring or a spiral that advances. And each time we feel we've come back to that, let's say, uh, primary point or primary place that we were, each time we've advanced that much. So it is an advancement. And the tradition, it's called Tozan's Five Ranks. Uh, the fourth rank is called the Advanced Achievement, and the fifth rank is called Integration, or Unity. You say, so you're right, it is an Integration or a Unity. But the fourth one does feel more like a fall than it does an advancement. Later, when you learn to embody it, incorporate it, accept it, embrace it, then you can see it's actually an advancement. Right. Boy, there's a lot of uh, teachers, well-known teachers, who have come either from the East to the West or perhaps even started out in the West who could really have used something of the nature you're talking about because it almost seems like it's the exception to find a teacher who hasn't gotten involved in some sort of scandal or, you know, some sort of major blow up over their behavior, even though they had well, apparently reached a very high state, you know, but the, the, a lot of the teachings that these people come from don't really have something in them to, uh, you know, deal with the shadow and, and work yeah. this stuff out. No, what you're saying is very true, although I don't know if you can avoid it. I think to get to the fifth level, you have to go through some kind of fall. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think it's avoidable. Uh, so I don't see that so much as, in, in a way, a disgrace to the person. I, I, it, what I see is the importance is how do they work with that? Yeah. Do, do they really begin to integrate that and own, you know, whatever it is, and it's usually karma hmm. that's brought them to that fall, or do they go into denial? about it, right? And then in, in that state of denial, they don't do any integration of that, and they can't move on, really, to the fifth level. Uh, so, you know, because most of the masters, with a few exceptions, came to the West, who were still fairly young. Mm -hmm. I mean, Suzuki Roshi was young, Katagiri Roshi was young, Mizumi Roshi was young, Kobenshino Roshi was young, and then Suzaki Roshi was maybe a little older when he came, but, you know, he's 103 now. Wow. And I, I don't know if he's ever gone through that particular fall uh, since he's been here. Maybe he did it before. Who knows? You know, he's, he's pretty old. <laughs> um, there's uh, others, you know, that Trumpa, you know, they were all young. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think Trumpa died at 47, Katagiri mm -hmm. and Maizumi Roshi both died at 64. Mm -hmm. You know, Chino Coben died also in the early 60s. Uh, that's pretty young. I mean, I'm 66 now, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been, you know, I've been around a while, but, you know, if I had died at 62, 64, you know, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now, and yeah. I can imagine in 10, 20 years, if I'm still alive, I'm going to look back and say, what a young whoopersnapper I was at 66, yeah. <laughs> you know, how green and immature, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm not just talking about Zen teachers. I don't even know that many about many Zen teachers, but you know, just a lot of spiritual teachers have have run yeah. into this sort of situation. And it's in, it's interesting. I never thought of it the way you're saying that it's it's actually a state of progress for them in a way that they're being that they're stumbling like that and being forced to sort of 
deal with issues that they perhaps thought they hadn't possessed. Um, exactly. Well, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm most familiar with Zen, of course, but Bhagwan, for example, who I really studied. I never met him. I which which actually, Bhagwan? Rajneesh, you mean? Oh, Rajneesh, Rajneesh. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Right. You know, and I actually had an experience in 1980 in our uh, big session, we call it Rohatsu, year-end session in December, where I actually became one with him. Hmm. But I predicted in 1978, my cousins were asking me, or actually, it's my aunt and uncle, my aunt and uncle were asking me about him because, you know, he was news. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, he's going to have a great fall, yeah. which he did. You know, yeah. It was predictable because he was ignoring the law of causation. Well, that's what we all do. Mm -hmm. At level three, which is the absolute again, uh, we ignore cause and effect or karma. And we ignore it because at level three, it doesn't exist. Yeah. There is no and, karma. And there are a lot of teachers out there now, the sort of neo advaita crowd, who actually say that very thing. They say, you know, karma, reincarnation, all these things, they're just sort of concepts. They don't exist. You don't exist. The world doesn't exist. And, and they kind of beat that drum over and over again. And That's stuck at level three. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. I was stuck at level three. Like I said, from 71 to 94, but particularly 86 to 90, 94, which is eight years, you know, eight years of being stuck where I said the same things, mm -hmm. you know, and you tend to ignore the karma that you're creating, which is a very dangerous place to be. Yeah, and some of them are moving out of that, I'm glad to see. Uh, you know, various people I've been interviewing. Um, you know, there was one guy who talked about taking a walk with his mother, and his mother said, "Oh, look at that beautiful tree." And he went into this whole cold rap about, "Oh, there is no tree, there is no person, there is no this." And, and it was like, you know. Uh, yeah. And then later on, he now he's looking back at that and saying, "You know, geez, what a jerk I was." <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll tell you my own experience with my mother in that same period, from '86 to '94. It was '87, and. I brought her to Holland, where I was living at that point, or maybe it was 86, uh, later in that year. Uh, I brought her to Holland, and we're walking all day around uh, Amsterdam, around the canals. I mean, we had a wonderful day at the time. And she was probably at that point in her late 70s. And we're coming back on the uh, metro, and I was sitting across from her, and I said, Mom, wasn't that a wonderful day? It's been just great, hasn't it? You know, all this walking and everything. And she said, oh, yeah, it was really good. And I said, you know, you live across the street from the beach. You know, she lived in Long Beach, just one block from the beach. I said, why don't you do that every day? Why don't you take a walk every day? It was so good for you, you know, in that fresh air. And take a walk, you know. And she says, Dennis, when are you going to just accept me how I am? <laughs> <laughs> good one. And it was great because it hit me. I mean, it was a dagger right into my heart, you know, yeah. because what did I want from my mother, which I never got, just accept me how I am, mm -hmm. you know, and I couldn't even deliver. Right. I couldn't do it for her. Here I would have been practicing 25 years and I couldn't do it for her. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Let's go back. Uh, let's go back to the 70s again. So you, you were sitting on this mountaintop and you had this profound experience. Did you have a clue what was going on at that point? <laughs> um, not, a, not a clue. I, I mean, did you realize this was a spiritual experience? I mean, because there's no. this one lady I interviewed that was just, she's just a housewife in Arizona and her grandmother died and, and she started thinking a little bit about, you know, what happens when we die. And, and next morning she woke up with this sort of energy in her head and she ended up having this profound Kundalini awakening just spontaneously and didn't know what was going on. She thought she was going crazy. Well, I told you, I thought I went insane. Yeah. yeah. I, no, I had no clue. Um, I started really reading a lot. I, I had not been, uh, I had a master's degree and all that, but I was not an avid reader. I was not a seeker. I was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to read around Christian mysticism, Jewish mysticism. I started reading Jung, Carl Jung, and, yeah. and Freud, and, and Maslow, and, you know, Fritz Perls. I had read Fritz already. You know, I'd, I'd done some Gestalt therapy from 68. This was 71. Mm -hmm. But, I hadn't really studied anything about religion or spirituality or mysticism. And so, as I read, I could say, I think I had some kind of mystical experience. That's about yeah. what I would say. Or some kind of opening. And you enjoyed it anyway. You thought, well, this is cool. I mean, well, it, was it wasn't. More than that, it changed my life. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like I had been a freight train going 180 miles, let's say a bullet train in Japan, going 180 miles an hour in a particular direction. And the direction was, 
you know, Olympics, uh, trying out for the Olympics, you know, succeeding in athletics and sports, getting a master's degree, going to go on for a PhD, you know, wanted to, I wanted to be superintendent of schools of California, you know, <laughs> Max Rafferty's job, you know, uh -huh. very, you know, very uh, ambitious, right? right. And uh, to be well known, to be successful, all that. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it all just was meaningless, hmm. just meaningless. It was empty, completely empty. And the only thing that gave my life meaning from that moment on was continuing to clarify the mind, myself, and to help others awaken. And I began that day, I started turning everybody I met on, so I became, you know, this stink of Zen, right? Where I'm, I'm turning on my, I was teaching uh, EH children, emotionally disturbed or handicapped children who had educational problems. And uh, there were brilliant kids, some of them. They just couldn't sit still in the classroom or do anything. I'm teaching them to meditate, you know. We're spending like two hours a day meditating, you know. Principal's getting really upset. You know, we go outside, we go to the park, and we're being a tree, we're being a dog, we're being a bird, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even know anything about cons, but I had them be all these different animals and different plants and everything. Did it work? And it did. I mean, they loved school. Cool. And they could sit still, and, and they did incredibly well. But I didn't teach them a whole lot of the three R's. I mean, I just right. lost interest in that. I just wanted them to enjoy their life and wake up and be conscious human beings. Mm. And I taught my teacher's aid, and I taught the other teachers. I even tried to teach the principal in the school how to meditate, but he wouldn't go for it. You know? Did you ever I have any of those kids get back in touch with you years later and say, hey, I'm so glad you did that. It really changed my life. I did a couple of them, but you know, I dropped out of out of the whole site by um, yeah. what year was it? Seventy one, and this was around sixty eight nine. Mm. No, it was even no. I dropped out. This was seventy one. I dropped out. Yeah, I left in seventy one. I left huh. six months after that, so I wasn't around too much. Yeah. I had a, a high school teacher that I really loved, and, and she really sort of got me, you know, and, and understood me, and, re and I, I really connected with her. And I found out years later she had become a professional psychic. <laughs> I had a college at USC, graduate school, and she's probably still alive. Her name was uh, Grummet. Uh, anyways, she, she was that for me. She yeah. really saw something in me. I was not a good college student. I was just an average C-plus college student. You know, in graduate school, I did really well because she took me under her wing. She was the head of this. We were the first national teacher corps to go into Watts and into East L.A., Boyle Heights area and uh, teach, you know, right after the riots in 65. We went into 66 and uh, teaching fifth and sixth grade kids. Uh, and she took me under her wings and I really blossomed. Uh, from having that kind of mentor, you yeah. know, which changed my life. So you had this profound experience, and you and you became an avid seeker, I guess, reading a lot of different books and checking into all kinds of things. Did you? Uh, how long did it take you to sort of settle into Zen? I mean, did you try a bunch of things? Yes, I did. Uh, I would say from March until really maybe June. Well, I had that's a, not long. <laughs> Three months or something. Well, yeah, that's all. But it seemed like a long time. Yeah, yeah. I was I was playing around with. I, I studied uh, integral yoga. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Swami Satchidananda. Swami Satchidananda. Yeah. Yeah, I studied with that, and you know, I did a number of things, read a lot. But I was on a mountaintop. I, it was sometime in June. I think it was towards the end of June, uh, up in Glacier National Park. Oh, and, I love that place. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. And my friends had just decided to go back to Long Beach. They'd come to visit me. And we had this van that I had actually sold my former girlfriend. I sold her the van, a uh, good price. And I took off with my backpack, and I saw this sign that said, 50 miles to Waterton National Park. Mm -hmm. And I had no provisions. I was actually heading to the general store to get some food. I had a little bit of granola in a plastic bag, and I had a little brown rice in a plastic bag, and I had some dry milk in a plastic bag. And I had my little kit because I'd been on the road hitchhiking all over for a couple, well, a few weeks by then. So I had a little grill, you know, and um, tennis shoes, no socks, right? And I see this sign, and instead of going like a, a sane person to the market first, mm -hmm. I just said, screw it, I'm going, you know? Wow. And I took off on this mountain, had to cross a glacier, and it was really amazing. Oh, so but, you weren't walking on the road, you were going on the trail to, to Waterton. 
There's a trail called the Water Tin oh, in wow. that country over 50 Jeez. mountain peaks. And yeah, with, so, with 500 grizzly bears in the vicinity. <laughs> well, actually, somebody was killed the night before. Yeah. We got to one of the campgrounds. A grizzly mm -hmm. killed a woman who was in her period. Uh, we were in that campground the very next day, and a yeah. grizzly the following day in another campground came through our camp. Wow. And by that time, there were three of us. I, I, I wanted to get to that part. but So I had no food. So, you know, I, I decided that I'd cook up the brown rice that first night. I cooked up a big pot, and then there were some other guys camping, and I went up and I offered them some brown rice. I said, I got a lot here, more than I can eat. Would you like some? They said, oh, yeah, sit down. We've got a lot of food. So we teamed up, and I had food. Okay. <laughs> it, took, it took us five days to make the hike. And the one night where three of us were lying there in our sleeping bags, and the grizzly came through our camp and started, you know, ransacking it. And we just covered our heads up with a sleeping bag and just laid there. And he eventually walked away. But mm. that was pretty scary. Oh, I yeah. know. Boy, your heart pounds. <laughs> you think you're not, you think you're fearless. And then, you know, something, oh, yeah. something like that. Boy. <laughs> yeah, when, when I was in Glacier, somebody got attacked by a bear, too. And uh, I was sitting in my tent meditating. It was rainy. And, and I heard this helicopter coming. I didn't know what was going on. It landed fairly nearby. And it turns out, you know, it was a medical helicopter pick, coming to pick this woman up who had been attacked. And for days after that, everybody was really spooked. But but anyway, so you, you were hiking up to, to Waterton. And um, I think this, this story has a spiritual corollary to it as, yeah, well, as, the, it as, as well as the adventure. <laughs> So the next day, we're at this point called 50 Mountain Peak, and I went up there alone, and I'm sitting there, and you look down at 50 mountain peaks from mm. this point. I mean, you know, talk about spectacular, amazing. And I had an experience there where I realized that my life's vocation is to be a Zen master. Ah. And this was just June of 71, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's when I realized that my path was Zen uh, and not some other path. And uh, have you ever had a actual profession uh, other than being a Zen student and teacher? Or has it, have you somehow managed to work out your finances to do this full time ever since then? Well, no, I, I did. I was a school teacher from 66 until 74. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, I had to go back. I, I took a year off. I went back and I taught school for a couple of years from sometime, I think, 72 to 74, or maybe 73 to 74. I don't remember. It was two years. And that's the only profession that I've had since then. I was also a lifeguard for many years before, uh, as I was a teacher, and even before I was a teacher, since I was actually 16, I was a lifeguard on the Huntington Beach and Long Beach. But no, that's it. Uh, I've managed to survive uh, teachings then, really since 1974. Hmm. And so... Well, when you had when you became a Zen student and you started to get into these really long things, like three months at a time of long meditations and all, what was that like? What was the experience like uh, meditating for so long each day? Was it uh, was it sort of like arduous and difficult and unpleasant, or did you really sort of you know get into it and, and have all, profound experiences? All the above. You know, yeah. if, I, if I am a little bit glib, it was sitting long, getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. Uh, you know, we, we sat very long, we got very tired, and I had to go on and do another seven weeks in Europe of sessions after the three months, mm. uh, because that's really where I earned my, my living, was touring Europe and teaching sessions and retreats. Um, and so, but I had very profound experiences during that, we all did. And probably why I can do what I can do today is because of those very long, uh, sittings and retreats that we went very deep into what we call samadhi mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know various openings various enlightened experiences or Kensho experiences but I gotta say that even though I did all that sitting and had the various realizations that since I uh, gave birth this is what I call it to the big mind process in 99 which was integrating the western psychotherapy of you know, uh, Hal and Sidra Stone, Fitz Pearls, and of course Carl Jung, integrating the Western psychological with uh, Zen tradition, I've got to say that it's night and day difference. Uh, the clarity, 
that I've been able to access using the big mind, even uh, as I work with people and also continue to work on myself with the process, uh, it's night and day different. Cool. Well, we'll get into the big mind. I want to really dwell on that uh, just in just a bit. Um, so, so, so you're saying that just all that long traditional Zen practice, you know, which I presume was traditional. Very traditional. The, the, the big mind is, is, uh, is night, night and day from that in terms of the, the effect it has on you. That's what you're saying. That is, that is what I'm saying, yes. Yeah. Um, is it worth recounting any of the experiences that you had during that period, or are they just sort of like, you know, sights along the trail that, you know, are not really worth dwelling on? Um, you know, during that period from, we're talking now, 86 to 94, uh, maybe one is worth uh, citing, and that is uh, in 86 when I had what we would call the more or less Daikensho experience where, um, you know, all doubt is, is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I really saw that I gave up being a Zen monk, a Zen teacher, uh, and really was just an ordinary person. But the flip side was uh, also there, that's the shadow that uh, I think I stank from high heavens uh, uh, about Zen in that uh, feeling I was so completely ordinary, was so extraordinary, uh, uh -huh. it became, you know, it became a trip in itself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, literally, you, you kind of glow, you know, yeah, almost like you've got a halo around you or something. Right. And that lasted until 94. But the, the real major experience was 94, uh, where, and I can tell you a little bit about that because it's the most interesting. Sure. So, so what happened was uh, I was on my way to Europe to teach, and um, I was, um, my girlfriend at that time said to me, you know, um, we're not married, and if you want to date and see other women, it's okay. And... I thought, oh, that sounds nice, you know. I get to Europe, uh, and she's back in uh, Salt Lake, and I started to think, why is she giving me this uh, <laughs> this gift, right? And I realized, oh, maybe she wants to. And I started to get a little jealous, and I hadn't been jealous since way back in 1972, where I think I just disowned jealousy. I mean, I just put it under the basement, you know. And uh, when I was I was in a, a monastery in northern France. And uh, one of my students, who's now one of my senseis, gave me a book called The Flight of the Garuda. And it's a Tibetan book. And uh, I, I opened up the book and I read this passage. And in this passage, it said, if you want to annihilate your ego or kill your ego, this is a practice for you. And I go, oh, that's exactly what I want. And I still have too much ego and I want to get rid of my ego. You know, I want to kill it. I want to annihilate it. And the practice was to use jealousy as an emotion that has the capacity to destroy the ego. Because if you think about it, and it didn't say this in the book, but I did think about it after. If you think about jealousy, it's the only emotion of all emotions that contains what we call the three poisons, all three. It's got greed, it's got anger, and it's got delusion. Hmm. Most of the others have two, but not three. They're yeah. delusion and anger or delusion and greed, but this one has all three. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're deluded into thinking there's another, and you're separate from that other. You're greedy to have, to own, to possess, to, you know, mm -hmm. to covet. And you're angry because that beloved one or other is um, maybe seeing somebody else, making love with somebody else, or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went into that, and the, the, it was a, a Dzogchen practice, and the way you did this practice was you, you visualize the worst possible scenario that you could visualize where your lover uh, is making love with other men or mm -hmm. other women. Uh, and you actually make your lover, your partner, into your guru, mm -hmm. into your teacher, and you make bows. So what I was doing was I was leading these retreats, and there were seven weeks of them, and it, it was in Kala Rinpoche's uh, monastery, and I was sleeping in his bedroom, in his bed, 
uh, leading this retreat, and I was handed this book, and I started this practice, and I was uh, bowing to her all night long, and meditating all night long. So I would alternate an hour of bowing and an hour of, of meditation. Did you ever sleep? No, I didn't sleep for seven weeks. I, I didn't lie down for seven weeks. Wow. Uh, How could you physically do that? Not to I interrupt was, the story, but that's kind of interesting. Well, we talked about acid. I was like on, I don't know, five hits of acid all day and night. I hadn't taken anything. Uh, I was a natural uh, endorphins or whatever you would call right. that chemical uh, equivalent to being like on acid. I was so high, so clear, and in some kind of altered state where I was eating very little, mm -hmm. uh, only drinking water and juice, and um, not sleeping. Hmm. And it went on for weeks, uh, six or seven weeks. And during that time, there were two consecutive nights where I would lock my door at 9.30 p.m. when I was finished teaching all day, and then I would open it up at 4.30 a.m. when my Jishu would come in with a cup of coffee, and then I would teach all day. Mm -hmm. So during the night, that's what I did. And there were two consecutive nights where I just evaporated onto the floor. It was like I became a puddle on the floor. Uh, there was no ego left. There was no substance. It was like the bones and the structure of my being were gone, and I was just completely dysfunctional. I would just be like... A, a tomato that had just been stepped on on the floor. I was just totally, you know, uh, with with no self, no ego left. Are and you saying that if someone had come in the room, they would have literally seen you on the floor? Or you yes, literally, literally on the floor. Oh, okay. I would, I would be making bows, and then two consecutive nights, I just couldn't get up. I was huh. just, I was just there, wow. and just laying there. And you know, probably a lot of it was exhaustion. Uh, altered state of consciousness, all the meditation all day long, all night long. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, the ego was destroyed. And then I had to go and, and teach all day. And I remember thinking, thank God for the form, because the form was so much a part of me. I'd been doing it, you know, since 72. The form means the routine, uh, structured way of teaching? Is that yeah. what it means? Yeah. yeah, you know, I come up, get up, I, mean, I have full robes on, you know, making yeah. my bows, doing the greeting bows to everybody, walking around the zendo, uh, holding personal interviews, which you call doksan. Uh, it, there was a lot of formality to it, and I could just put myself into the form, and I didn't have to think, and I didn't have to create anything. I just, you know, I just put myself into that form. Uh, and then I locked the door again, and then the next night happened again, just completely destroyed. So a week later, I'm in Poland and leading the same kind of retreat in Poland, and still doing the same thing all night long, still sitting all night, and something very, very strange happened, and uh, really weird. So in the middle of my sitting, it was probably around 2 a.m., I got a visitation from t three beings. Uh, and I could make out who they were. They were all deceased. Uh, the 16th Karmapa, Kala Rinpoche, who they all started in his bedroom, and Shortam Trimpa Rinpoche, who I was quite close to back in the 70s and the very early 80s. Is he the one who died when he was 47? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. And, and he had kind of taken me under his wing and uh, became like an uncle to me. And these three visited me, and it's a little humorous. Uh, they said, uh, we're going to offer you to ask us three questions, and any questions you want uh, on Dharmic questions, and we'll answer them. Whatever you want to ask, we'll answer them. So, you know, I was thinking, well, what can I ask? And, you know, I'm doubting this whole thing as it's happening, you know, these aberrations, you know, uh, these entities. I've uh, never seen ghosts or anything like that before, you know. But it was, it was, Obviously them, and of course we could say it's all in my mind, it's all Machio, it's all mine, but... Uh, oh, can I have some water? Um, so, I said, well, I'm going to ask three questions I already know the answer to. Because <laughs> I've done these as cons, right? And so, uh, the first question is, uh, where do I come from? And as I was sitting there, 
I had this, you talked earlier about like a kundalini, it was kind of like a kundalini. The energy started in the pit of my being, in the pit of my, my you know, below my stomach, probably the first chakra. And it just raised up like this huge, just energy bolting through the top of my skull, out the top of my head. And what came out was, oh. So I come from home, okay? So then I thought, okay, next next question, where am I now? And again, I, I thought I knew the answer. And I'm sitting there, and the same thing happened, another bolt of energy, and it was home. So I'm home. All right, I got it. I, I come from home, I'm home. All right, where am I going? And then Trumpa said, you dumb fuck, you'll know when you get there. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> but that wasn't the... the he that cheated was, you out of your third answer. You did. were entitled to three. <laughs> well, he didn't cheat me. Y'all know when I get there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess that's an answer. <laughs> it's a, it was a very good answer in the way. Yeah. So the next night, I'm sitting, and this time I'm sitting opposite direction. That night I was actually facing a mandala that was on the wall, and this time I'm sitting away, looking away from the mandala, and these three aberrations come up, come in the room again. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, and this time, Trumpa reached down, and he tweaked my testicles, hmm. my genitals, and he flipped me, my energy, from yang to yin. Huh. And what he did, I mean, it's, it's all bizarre, I'm insane, right? Like, we know that, by now we know it. Uh, <laughs> I'm totally insane. He changed me from, at that point, I don't remember how old, but I think 50, from a 50-year-old man to a 17-year-old girl. Huh. In other words, you totally, at that moment, felt like a 17-year-old girl. For years. Really? For years you felt like one? Well, it actually, <laughs> okay. Were you like a, attracted to Donny Osmond and stuff like that? or? <laughs> no, I still had my attraction for women. Uh-huh. I just felt like I was in a woman's body. Now, huh. I wasn't, obviously, yeah. and I felt the same confusion that, uh, around everything that a 17-year-old girl must go through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lost all that aggression and aggressiveness, the, the young energy. All mm -hmm. my energy was very passive, mm -hmm. uh, very you know, inviting, very um, you know, bringing things in, but there was no bringing the energy out. There was no energy going out. There was no projecting energy. It was like, it was an amazing thing. And it, it only integrated completely one year ago last June. Hmm. So a year and a half ago. 15 years from the day it happened. So, you know, it was really strong for about a year. And then there was a few years, actually when I met uh, Ken Wilbur, which was uh, seven and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. I also spent some time with David Data, and I spent some time with Hal Stone's daughter um, and Judith Stone, and I was working on how do I integrate this masculine back into my feminine. Mm -hmm. and, and that was 2003. So you can see, 94 to 2003, I was still struggling with this uh, feminine energy that had overtaken me hmm. and it become really problematic problematic for me uh, and for a while there uh, I just had to ground myself so I got back into the gym and I started working out <laughs> adversely I mean I was I put on oh, 40 pounds of weight muscles I got down to a five six body percent body fat I was, I bulked up, to, I was lifting 335 pounds on bench presses, I mean, I, I just trying to get my masculinity back, you know, yeah. because I've always been very masculine, and all of a sudden yeah. I find myself in a, in a body very feminine, and uh, it really put me through something. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, I mean, did other people also remark that oh, you had everybody, had, everybody you totally changed? Oh yeah, I was yeah. a chiropractor who saw me before that trip and after that trip. Uh, I was in Portland, and he said, what happened to you? Yeah. You know, you, you, 
You're, you've changed completely. You're not in your body. Your body is very feminine. You, you move like a woman. You know, what's going on? And I told him, he said, get yourself to the gym, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's so in I other did. words, so you didn't actually become sort of, um, you know, attracted to men like no, a 17-year-old no, no. girl. But you're talking more about sort of the feminine, gentle, receptive, you know, that's soft, soft. You know, yeah, all that stuff. All the qualities, you know, I became much more empathic. 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 You know, more, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, much more uh, intuitive and, and, and all of that. And uh, much less aggressive mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, pushy, you know. It was, it was really like there was no ego. It's know? interesting because I don't, you know, when, when I hear you say this, I don't get the impression that this was something that came from outside into you. It's more like a whole section of yourself which had been sort of bottled up in some way was suddenly let out okay. of the bottle, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and, and that... The yeah, genius. and it became kind of predominant because it was it was released so suddenly that it eclipsed the uh, the more masculine side. Put exactly. that back in the bottle for a while. Yeah, exactly. It took yeah. me fifteen years to integrate that back in. Hmm. You know, talk about the subtle, sudden, and gradual. This was the gradual part of the path, which it took that long to integrate. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the whole world would probably be a more uh, peaceful place if everyone were to undergo such a shift, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> I don't think we have a choice, but, you know, when you, when you consider how much uh, cruelty and, and, you know, aggression and, you know, greed and, and all this stuff that from ego-driven uh, personalities that's inflicted upon the world. Um, well, I'll we tell you another outcome from this. And that is, once you lose your ego, you lose the desire to lose your ego. Yeah. You see because, what I mean? Because the very desire to lose it is in itself an egotistical sort of drive, right? Yeah, and why would you want to lose it if you didn't have it in the first place? Yeah. It's because we're so much identified with the ego and we're so into the ego that we want to be less egoistic, you know, or egotistical and more egoless. And that had been driving me until 94, from 71 huh. to 94. I think one of my biggest drives was to be more selfless, more egoless. Yeah. And then once it happened, I go, this is, you know, I'm dysfunctional. Huh. I need to have an ego. I need to integrate an ego. I need to have a healthy ego if I'm going to function in the world and do anything. And that's part of what I call the fall from grace. So you're associating this shift uh, to a, a, a teenage feminine <laughs> nature. <laughs> well, to, to be a loss of ego, you're, you're associating, you're defining. Well, it happened as, uh, a week later. It happened because teenage girls have egos, you know. I mean. Oh yeah. But, no, but it, it happened a week later, and probably because of the loss of the ego, I was receptive to that shift. Oh, okay. You know, uh, that's probably how it and why it happened one week later. Uh, so your loss of ego happened a week later. The the shift no, to the, the opposite. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That the, explain. Clarify. Okay. Okay, so the loss of ego happened when I was in Holland in the Netherlands. And one week later, I found myself in Poland doing another retreat. And that's when these two events happened I with, see. with the three With entities. the three spooks, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and was, was the uh, loss of ego in Holland just as abrupt and dramatic and definitive as, as this uh, shift to your feminine nature? Absolutely. Huh. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, like I said, it was two consecutive nights where the ego was just completely, I mean, it just died, you know. I uh, see. And yeah. I was very dysfunctional. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine, you know, but yeah, that, that's what happened. And then a week later, probably because I was so vulnerable and so mm -hmm. raw that this other experience could happen, and probably because I trusted, and I, and I, I, I love Trooper Ricochet, and I consider him probably the greatest 20th century uh, master you know, of our time, uh, I really had great admiration for him. Uh, it's probably why I chose Trumpa, you know, or he chose me. Genpo and I had some technical difficulties towards the end of this interview, and uh, also both of our wives were calling us to do other things. So we decided to do a second interview, a follow-up interview, in a few weeks. Um, so if this one seemed to end somewhat abruptly, that's why, and there will be another one in early February. If you'd like to be notified of that and of 
all the interviews that I do, um, you can email me, rick at batgap.com, and I'll put you on an email notification list. So look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.